In this lecture, we're going to be looking at a very important principle for enolate formation. And you see now why this is important, and it's the idea of kinetic versus thermodynamic control. I'm going to start off with just by looking at the, the acetoacetic acid. And we, we recognize here that the, the difference between these two protons is actually quite significant. These are way more acidic than the terminal ones over there. And so if we want to deprotonate um, over here, it's, it's very easy. And any base that we add to this molecule is first going to deprotonate uh, protons here because they are the most acidic. And, and that should be second nature to you right now. But if I had to put down, and we're just going to use probably one of the, the simplest of ketones, next simplest of ketones, uh, is 2-butanone. And if we had to treat that with a base, um, I hope you appreciate that there are two possible enolate uh, possibilities. The one looks like that, and the other one looks like this over here. So we've got two possibilities over there. And actually, there, there is a third one, and uh, I want you to, to think about it. It's probably going to confuse a little bit of or some of you when I say that, but there is a third one. It's actually very, very similar to one that we've just drawn. Um, and um, I want you to just give a bit of thought about that because that actually will be important for some reactions later on. But nevertheless, um, just let's look at these at these two. We appreciate that it depends on whether we deprotonate it there or there. Now, in terms of acidities of protons, they are basically the same. There isn't a difference between which one uh, is more acidic or less acidic. The differences are so small that we can't select by using a strong or weak base uh, in order to do that. But just looking at these two enolates, there's some things that we can say about them. The first thing is that this one over here is more stable. Uh, and the other one, uh, the terminal uh, enolate, is less stable. Um, when we talk about st uh, stability, we're talking about the overall energy of the uh, of these systems. And so um, uh, this one over here will be at a slightly higher energy than this molecule over here. The reason for this is that the double bond here is has three substituents on it. And over here, this double bond only has two substituents. Um, obviously not, not counting the hydrogens. And these lend stability overall to, to double bonds. So looking at these two, we can very quickly say that this is less stable than this one over here. Um, <clears throat> obviously things that lend stability, like substitution on a double bond, will make something more stable. And there can be other things that will make uh, things more stable, including conjugation, which is an important one as well. But the more stable enolate, we call that the thermodynamic one. Dynamic enolate. And the less stable one is called the kinetic one. Let me explain uh, where this comes from. The, the thermodynamic enolate comes from the fact that it is the more stable one. Thermodynamically, it is the more stable enolate, um, whereas the kinetic enolate, kinetic is, has that word speed associated with it. Um, it is the enolate that is formed faster. All right. Now, why would this one be formed faster? Well, we go back to our starting material over here, and we just look at the possibilities. If we deprotonate here, we get the kinetic enolate. If we deprotonate here, we get the thermodynamic enolate. Over here, we have three hydrogens. Over here, we've got two. So statistically speaking, we've actually got a greater chance and more hydrogen possibilities to choose from. And so deprotonating over here is likely to be faster. It's also likely to be faster because this carbon here with the three hydrogens on it is less sterically encumbered, right? There's only just got one bond to another carbon than over here that has two uh, carbons on it. This is a secondary position and this is a primary position. So the primary position is less sterically encumbered, there are more protons there, and so this one is just, if you add a base to it, just statistically, it's gonna want to deprotonate here first. It's the first choice, and so it ends if it does that, we get what is known as the kinetic enolate. It's much easier to get to that. Um, deprotonating here gives you the thermodynamic enolate. 
Now, what we need to discuss is, is how do we generate these inlays? Um, and before we can even just talk about the, the how, just one uh, more bit of information, and that is that your kinetic inlays, um, although it forms very quickly, if you're not careful, the kinetic inlays can go towards the thermodynamic uh, inlays. And the only way that this can happen, all right, is under equilibrium conditions. In other words, if this forms, but then under equilibrium conditions it goes back to this, then it has a chance to go to this one over here. So what might happen in a reaction is in the beginning, you're forming this, but because it's going backwards, because we're under equilibrium conditions, all right, then uh, over time, you're going to get the more stable inlet over here, which is the thermodynamic. And so in order to get the kinetic inlet, we need to make sure that we're not under equilibrium conditions. And that's part of the, the first clue in these two forms. The secret to forming kinetic inlets is actually very easy. And it had to do with what I mentioned, is that we cannot be under equilibrium conditions. And you know already that equilibrium conditions are set up when we have relatively weak bases that are deprotonating. But if we have strong, strong bases that effectively push the equilibrium all the way to the right-hand side, that prevents an equilibrium being set up. And so we get the kinetic inlate. So the inlate that we're looking for is this one over here. This would be the kinetic enolate in this reaction uh, or, or of this uh, ketone over there because it's the least substituted uh, enolate. If the double bond had been on this side, it would be the thermodynamic enolate. And the way we do this very simply is via the addition of LDA at minus 78 degrees Celsius uh, in THF. This is your go-to method for forming kinetic enolates. Why is LDA so good? Because it pushes the equilibrium all the way to the one side. Why is it also good? Because it is sterically bulky, right? These two isopropyl groups that are on the LDA negative charge, that steric bulk over there means that the base wants to deprotonate there, not there. This is more sterically congested, all right? We've got a tertiary center versus a secondary center. It wants to deprotonate next door to um, the, 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 the most sterically accessible center. So we can take away the proton and we get the product there. So LDA is your go-to base for wanting to form kinetic enolates because it's very strong, no equilibrium, it's sterically bulky, and so when it deprotonates, it deprotonates at the most accessible position, which is what always forms, that's the kinetic uh, type of enolate. So this is your go-to method for kinetic enolate formation. Thermodynamic enolate formation is uh, a little bit more trickier, um, only in the sense that there are many other factors that we need to consider when we're doing something like the, the thermodynamic enolate. Um, the most uh, and one of these factors are, for instance, like setting up an equilibrium condition. If you're wanting to do a reaction with this, then using weak bases tend to be um, a better option, particularly setting up under conditions where equilibria can be allowed. So we don't want to be working at low temperatures. Um, one example of using a weak base here might be something, for instance, such as sodium hydride. Um, sodium hydride will deprotonate, and it, because it's a weak base, it'll, if it deprotonates here, um, it forms the enolate. Um, but remember, I did say that the uh, sodium hydride is an irreversible base. Um, that's okay, um, because even if it forms the kinetic, uh, even though it forms the kinetic uh, enolate, which would look uh, like this, just do that, um, this one can go and react with this, and then take it forward to uh, this inhalator over here. So the condition still might be reversible because we're leaving this at low temperature. This is not a strong base, so it doesn't quickly push all the way to one side. It very slowly reacts, and there'll be time for it to actually form the, uh, the thermodynamic inhalator. So this is a good uh, method using something like sodium hydride. Sodium methoxide, the weak bases would have also been fairly good. Uh, there is one other method which is is very important and possibly 
Um, the safest for you to just think about when you are doing um, this sort of chemistry, and that is to use uh, TMS chloride and, and form the silyl enol ether, all right? Triethylamine, dichloromethane at room temperature. Whenever you form silyl enol ethers, they will perform, prefer to form the thermodynamic uh, intermediates, uh, TMS, all right? So this is always preferred, the silyl enol ethers, um, under thermo, they're under thermodynamic conditions, and so that is probably a good go-to method um, for uh, generating a ther thermodynamic enolate equivalent. Of course, this is not an enolate. Um, if we're going to use this, we then need to make sure that what electrophile we are using, um, we've either got to generate a carbocation for alkylation, um, and so we use Lewis acids, and we'll see some other examples of that. But actually, just to remind you that um, this can be converted to that over there, which can also be just as useful. So we can form this um, silyl enol ether, and then just by the addition of methyl lithium, methyl lithium can attack the silyl group, we get tetramethyl silane, and we get the O minus being formed. Of course, the lithium will be the counter ion um, over there. So we can use silyl enol ethers with Lewis acids, right? Um, so we add a Lewis acid and we add our alkylating agent, um, whatever it might be, maybe it's a tertiary alkylating agent, like that. But if we want to use an enolate specifically, we can generate that by adding methyl iodide. It's just another way of, of, of using the silyl enol ethers. All right, so don't, don't uh, see it as like this is the only way of doing it. We're just improving and expanding on the toolbox of things that you are being exposed to.